I feel that there there is a sense of urgency that ideally I think that the state would like it if they did not have to go through all this litigation, if they could come, reach an agreement with these school districts where we're increasing funding in a way that we don't have to go through the courts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a very complicated issue that, you know, going going back to the original uh, Claremont uh, lawsuit uh, m- many years ago at this point, uh, the issue of trying to figure out what an adequate education is, is that you know, fundamentally a, a, a political decision or is there some way that the this can be done kind of more empirically through research, something to kind of figure out exactly how much money uh, uh, students should be getting per uh, school district should be getting per student and how to how to pay for it the property taxes as we've discussed have become problematic but a minimum these this loss of stabilization grants is four percent reduction per year over the last three years to a lot of these school districts has just been really uh, really tough on them so uh, I, I think in the end this is going to be litigated in the courts so there is this new uh, education funding commission that's supposed to figure out what the answer to all this is I'm always kind of suspicious that commissions can never really do this kind of stuff, but maybe they will. Uh, but the fundamental question is, how do you come up with a figure uh, that everybody can live with that makes sense and that is, has an appropriate funding mechanism so it doesn't hit too heavily on one group rather than another? But you know, we've been talking about this for a long time at this point. And we'll be talking about it for a lot more years yeah. because um, the Supreme Court has backed out of education funding. It's essentially said since their landmark decision in 1999, we're no longer looking at this issue with a strict scrutiny. In other words, you don't come to our door to get relief. You've got to go back to the lower courts. Now, folks will remember the Claremonts and other school districts that first sued the state in 1991 yeah. didn't get an order for eight years until there was a finally a decision by the Supreme Court, which forced the legislature to create this trust fund to raise dedicated state taxes to support education aid. Twenty years later, certainly there's an argument to be made That's not enough money. But I think many legislators on both sides of the aisle understand intuitively there's got to be some kind of solution coming from the legislature and this governor on education funding, an incremental one, before there's going to be any settlement or any lawsuit succeeding in the lower courts. Other news we've been reporting on this week, uh, the push to legalize recreational use of marijuana has seen a setback. The Senate voted yesterday to delay action on a legalization bill until late December or early next year. Uh, The bill had passed the House in April, but not with enough votes to override a promised veto from Governor Sununu. Uh, Also, the New Hampshire Senate has approved a proposal to implement so-called no-excuse absentee voting. Uh, Currently, absentee ballots are available only to certain voters, including those with physical disabilities and those who are out of town on Election Day. The bill passed by the Senate yesterday would remove all those restrictions and make absentee ballots available to all voters. Um, Also, uh, the Senate Finance Committee is also trying to compromise with Governor Sununu over what uh, the governor hoped would be a $26 million standalone psychiatric hospital. Uh, Anna Brown, uh, what's your understanding of the compromise in the Senate? Sure. So the Senate Finance Committee said, all right, what are some other options here, more incremental options? And so right now they're looking at $17 million. So that's almost 10 million less, and it would be 24 beds instead of 60 beds. But they're also looking at expanding some other inpatient options for youth. So the idea is, okay, well, we're going to do it, but it's not going to be the whole hog that uh, Sununu was looking for. You did hear from the Department of Health and Human Services that they said, this is still great. This is still a way forward. We like this. So it's looking like that's going to be sort of the compromise, of course. There are going to have to be many compromises in this budget. So even if this one thing makes Sununu happy, if it we're still freezing business taxes, increasing school funding too much, family medical leave, you're still going to see a veto. Mm, okay. And how, how motivated law- are lawmakers to get this done, do you think? I think lawmakers in the Senate in particular are very motivated to make this happen. Senator Lou D'Alessandro, when he was talking about his education funding proposal, he was saying that this is a budget that will pass. We need to pass a budget. We, you know, we can't be caught up in political posturing. And so there's a lot of motivation in the Senate. I think in the House, it can be more difficult to wrangle 400 members to get them behind a proposal. So, yeah, a, a veto is looking pretty likely at this point. Yeah, and particularly when you get into the issue, anything dealing with, with tax increases or perceived tax increases by the perceived by Sununu to be an increase. You know, the family medical leave, there's, they've, he's labeled it an income tax. Right. Uh, there's this issue of the capital gain, expanding the interest and dividends a tax to capital gains. And that's something that's kind of been in and out of the budget. So, you know, anything that's going to pose a, pati- a, a political problem. Uh, I think is going to be subject to pretty intense debate and scrutiny because uh, that's kind of a that's kind of a classic line in the sand for for Republicans and Governor mm-hmm. Sununu has been very very vocal about that that he won't sign on to anything that he can perceive as, a, as some sort of a tax increase. Yeah, I, 
I, I'm not sure this is a budget that's definitely going to be vetoed or not. Both sides really staked out really strong positions early in the spring. And I think it was because Sununu realized that's really the only leverage he had, uh, that in order to try and prevent Democratic legislative leaders from spending too much money and taxing too much, he had to th- throw around the V word and did repeatedly. And I think much like President Trump in Washington, what Sununu has now that he didn't have a few months ago is a very unified Republican Party that's going to support not only any veto decision on the budget, but pretty much most veto decisions that are going to come down in the next several months. So that gives him the leverage he needs, and that's why you're seeing the state Senate pull back a number of these things that Sununu has drawn his line in the sand about because they know at the end of the day he can sustain a veto in the Senate and in the House. So if we're going to get a budget, we've got to we've got to meet him halfway. And that's what this horse trading over the next several weeks is really going to be all about. Can you give Sununu enough so he'll grudgingly sign or allow the budget to become law without a signature, which, again, is an option every governor has. This is the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup on The Exchange on NHPR. I'm Peter Biello, and in just a little bit, New Hampshire is filing suit against big chemical companies for causing PFAS chemical contamination in the state's drinking water. We'll speak with NHPR's Annie Ropeek about this after a quick break. Stay tuned. This is NHPR. Good morning. Make a gift to NHPR today to support the news you trust. And when you do, you'll be entered into a double drawing for a Southwest Airlines gift card worth $1,000 each. We're picking the lucky winner soon, so don't wait. Give now at NHPR.org. Support for NHPR comes from your listeners and from Tough Self Freedom Plan, offering businesses health plans with the benefits that matter to employees. Learn more at THFP.com slash better coverage. And from Plan Something New Hampshire weekend taking place this coming Saturday and Sunday, June 1st and 2nd, with special events throughout the state. PlantSomethingNH.org Sunny for today, high temperatures, mid-60s to lower 70s, partly cloudy tonight, overnight lows, 40s to lower 50s. Then sunny tomorrow, it'll be turning cloudy in northern parts of the state in the afternoon. Highs tomorrow, mid-60s north, mid-70s south. This is NHPR. This is the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup on The Exchange on NHPR. I'm Peter Biello. And coming up on The Exchange on Monday, we're checking in on New Hampshire's refugee program. The number of refugees being resettled in the state has dropped dramatically under the Trump administration's policies. We'll explore that and we'll also talk with refugees about their experience living in the Granite State. That's coming up at 9 o'clock live on Monday on The Exchange. But right now, we're rounding up the week's news with a panel of experts. Anna Brown, Director of Research and Analysis at Citizens Count, Senior Reporter for the New Hampshire Union Leader Kevin Landrigan, and Dean Spiliotis, Civic Scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU. And joining us for this part of the program is NHPR's Annie Ropeek. Annie, thank you very much for being here. Really appreciate it. Hi, good morning. So uh, we, we wanted to chat with you about uh, New Hampshire filing suit against three big chemical companies and five others causing PFAS con- chemical contamination allegedly in the state's drinking water. Governor Sununu made the announcement at a press conference with leaders from the Departments of Justice and Environmental Services, and he called the lawsuits some of the most significant the state has ever pursued. I spent 10 years of my career cleaning up uh, drinking water, uh, cleaning up groundwater, cleaning up soil. Uh, with a lot of these types of compounds. So, uh, Annie Ropeek, uh, tell us a little bit about these lawsuits. Um, He says they're pretty significant, the governor does. Uh, Are they? Yeah, they are. I mean, there aren't that many states that have filed suits like this, and New Hampshire's are a little bit different than the states that have filed suits. So um, there are two lawsuits, first of all. One focuses on just these three big chemical companies. So names you know, 3M, DuPont, and then Comores, which is a spinoff of DuPont that kind of owns their um, chemical liabilities uh, that just formed in 2015. The other lawsuit includes those three and then also includes five firefighting equipment companies that made firefighting foam, which includes PFAS and is responsible for a lot of the contamination we see, especially at military bases, fire stations, um, things like that. So that one is like specifically tailored to that kind of contamination. Um, And these are statewide lawsuits. So they're pretty broad. They don't talk very specifically about any area of contamination, like we've seen in Merrimack, for example, around the St. Cobain factory, which 
is a, a manufacturer that used these chemicals, so bought them in theory from these kinds of bigger chemical companies, or that we've seen uh, in Portsmouth around Pease Trade Port, which is um, largely due, again, to the effects of that firefighting home. So the suits don't get into that kind of detail. They say um, these chemicals are so ubiquitous across the state. We've seen them at various levels pretty much everywhere, all 10 counties, officials say, and um, we know that they are in the blood of pretty much every American to some level. Um, but the state says, you know, we've seen significant enough contamination um, just broadly all across New Hampshire and the groundwater and in other natural resources that it was worth taking this um, kind of broader approach, which we believe we're the first state in the country to file this kind of statewide suit. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people looking on with great interest, including uh, former state representative Mindy Mesmer. Uh, she's advocated for more PFAS regulation, and she hopes uh, they'll help cover health costs for people who've been exposed. You know, make sure that we don't just look at cost remediation and water lines to supply clean water. We also need to look at the public health costs. Public health costs, Annie. What would you say are the public health costs here? How much has this it cost us or cost the state? Well, that's the big question. So uh, I think that this suit also doesn't go into a lot of um, sort of numbers of, of costs or of even number of people that have been exposed. I mean, it sort of speaks broadly about thousands of people affected, hundreds put on public water lines or on bottled water. But I think they're hoping to get into that kind of detail as the suit goes forward, because the goal here really is a settlement. And so um, what that would achieve would be uh, some amount of money for the state to distribute to people affected by this. Now, the, the lawsuits really focus mostly on infrastructure. They say that uh, the state wants to recoup the costs of treatment and cleanup and of installing those public water lines, like Representative Messmer mentioned, um, to provide clean water to people that have had their wells contaminated. Um, it talks about uh, the cost of disposal of managing landfills that have PFAS in them, places like Coakley Landfill on the seacoast. Um, it doesn't talk too much about the health effects but um, and the health costs, but that really is a big question, and it's possible that that's something that could come up as the suit goes forward. Um, PFAS has been linked to all manner of serious health problems. Um, the, there's a really strong link between high cholesterol, kidney and liver disease, developmental delays, immune suppression, reproductive issues, and potentially also some cancers. Um, and so uh, people like Mindy Mesmer are really concerned. New Hampshire has some of the highest rates of certain cancers in the country, um, and they believe that may be linked to contamination issues like PFAS. So I think one question as these lawsuits go forward is how much the public health issues factor in and if there may be any money coming for people, not just to pay for um, water supplies and cleanup, but also to pay for their medical costs and, and the cost that that's going to um, bring to the state's health care system. Let's bring one more voice in really quickly. Uh, Laureen Allen of Merrimack Citizens for Clean Water speaking on WMUR. I think it's fabulous. Uh, we're waiting for the state to take some kind of action. Suing the manufacturers will definitely give some... Uh, money back to the states, and hopefully that will be for remediation and cleanup. And so, Annie, just to put a, a finer point on it, the state's case is that these companies uh, knew what they were doing, and and they they simply disregarded the the health effects that these these chemicals may have on the on the people surrounding the, the plants that or, or 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 people exposed to these chemicals. Yeah, absolutely. This is not a new allegation. The state is really picking up sort of a thread of this story that's been going on for some time now. But um, that is pretty much the the focus of the suits as far as, you know, allegations of, of criminal action go. Um, so basically, uh, documents that have come to light in past lawsuits like this, class action suits, that kind of thing, um, and also past reporting um, by a number of excellent journalists, um, have, have shown that companies, especially 3M and DuPont, knew for years, for decades, when they were making these chemicals, as far back as the 50s and 60s when these chemicals were invented, um, they knew that they could uh, have all of these really serious implications so that they could um, persist in the environment, that they'd be really hard to you know, clean up and get out of stuff once they were in the water or the soil. Um, they knew that they would accumulate in people's bodies. Um, and then they knew that they could have health risks. They did studies on monkeys that showed that they caused health problems. They um, there's, you know, the famous case that sort of set this ball rolling was in the Ohio River Valley of West Virginia, where workers at the plant that was making these chemicals and around the plant, this was a DuPont factory, had, to, you know, high rates of testicular cancer and thyroid issues, that kind of thing. And that's actually one of the big ongoing um, settlement cases that's sort of we're following in the footsteps of. And so that's the big allegation here is that these companies um, made a, essentially a defective product, a, a harmful product. They knew this and they marketed it anyway and in fact took steps allegedly to suppress that science, suppress that information as they were selling it. And then specifically on the firefighting foam makers, the allegation in that suit is that 
these companies were subject matter experts, basically, that they were buying these chemicals from 3M and DuPont and that they had to know the same stuff that 3M and DuPont did, that they were using it in these fire foams anyway, marketing them, same thing. And then that when it came, it came time in the early 2000s to phase these chemicals out of production per federal orders, once some of the science came to light, these firefighting foam companies specifically allegedly didn't tell users like the military and fire stations to stop using the stockpiles of the PFAS containing foams that they had, um, which means that on, we're, we're not using PFAS in many American made household products anymore, but we are still using it at some fire um, fighting efforts. And so this is something that is only just happening now that um, these users are starting to realize they need to stop using these kinds of products and, and start using something else. And that's why we've seen sort of contamination continue past the time when PFAS stopped being used widely in America. Yeah, Annie, it's uh, Dean Spiliotis. Uh, you know, I, I actually first became aware of PFAS. You mentioned household products, uh, uh, not from water contamination or, or firefighting foam. But, uh, you know, if you're watching TV, you see these ads for these miracle skillets that are nonstick. And mm -hmm. what I've noticed in recent uh, last year or so is that they now all say PFAS free as part of the advertising. So oh, apparently older uh, nonstick skillets and other kinds of nonstick products uh, all contain this particular ingredient. Well, it was in yeah, carpets, too. Stuff, right? Anything Carbons. that's sort of flame retardant, right, Annie? Yeah, that, I, I think of it as something that resists things. So mm. stain resistant carpets, which is why we worry about um, exposure for children, because that's the kind of stuff that kids are like chewing on and lying on. Mm. Um, also, uh, yeah, grease or heat resistance. So uh, sometimes it's called the Teflon toxin. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it was found in Teflon. That was DuPont's big role as they were buying it to make and market Teflon. Um, and yeah. then also Gore-Tex or any sort of water resistant um, clothing, uh, and all, all kinds of things. I mean, it really, I, I learned just recently glide floss, who knew, you know, those <laughs> that's right. Things. Yeah. There's a lot of reporting. Yeah. I mean, it really, it, it's, and this is, this is sort of the, the root of the problem is that they're so ubiquitous and then so persnickety. I mean, they're just really tricky chemicals that not only are they highly toxic, but they're just really hard to get rid of. And they're, you know, they stick to you and they build up. And, um, and the EPA had been saying this to these companies for years that you've really created a perfect storm here. And allegedly, the companies sort of pushed it as long as they possibly could um, to keep these in circulation. And that we're now all sort of reaping the consequences. But Annie, isn't New Hampshire one of the first case states to admit launch such a global suit precisely because the federal government still hasn't even decided what's an appropriate level of these compounds and contamination. I mean, so the science is not completely mature yet about what PFFs really uh, threatens us with. It could be even worse than we know right now. So yeah, if, no, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so two good points there. So we are one of the first suits of this kind, sort of the broad suit, and that is partly because the federal government hasn't um, formally regulated these yet. They have health advisories out right. that states have adopted as their own standards. Um, but then New Hampshire is also one of the few states that's taken the next step of making not just a sort of uh, groundwater, like a cleanup standard. So when you find it, this is the level you have to clean it up to. That's based on federal advice. But now we are just in this next month or so going to implement or propose a new um, limit on PFAS in drinking water. Um, and we will be one of the only states that has written our own one of those limits, and that will be for public water systems to have to test and treat. And, and one of their concerns, these municipalities and water utilities, is that this is basically an unfunded mandate that, right. you know, this is not a problem they cause. They're going to have to spend millions to deal with it. And so this suit is partly a response to that. It seeks to get them some money um, to help clean this up. And I should note that there have been comparisons drawn by the AG and others um, between the suit and New Hampshire's settlement with ExxonMobil for MTBE contamination. It's a pretty similar problem of sort of statewide scope, um, a, a company that used a chemical that turned out to be bad, and, and now the state is going to blame that company um, for causing this problem and get a bunch of money that um, sets up ability not just to treat and, and, and address that chemical, but also the MTBE settlement set up our whole groundwater trust fund, and that's been used for infrastructure upgrades, sewer upgrades all over the state. And so that is the kind of money that would have to cover PFAS response right now, and it's not enough, basically, mm -hmm. for all of the ways in which we need to address it. Um, and so this could potentially add to that money, though it's not clear yet exactly how the state would dole out whatever they get. And then just to Kevin's other point, the science definitely is still maturing. I mean, there's new studies that come out every day that 
are just slightly different than the last thing. And one of the tricks with these chemicals is, so this is, so when we say PFAS, that's a class of about 3,000 chemicals. It includes things you may have heard of, like PFOA and PFOS, but it's, it's really just a, a type of compound. And they're all a little bit different. They all act a little different. They all cause slightly different health problems in slightly different amounts. And it makes it really, really hard to study and regulate them in a sort of uniform way. And that's something that regulators are struggling with. Um, even at the state level, and it's something that the, the feds are going to try to deal with. There's been calls for these things to be regulated as a class as opposed to one by one, just to kind of get things moving faster. Um, so the federal government is supposed to put out regulations on these chemicals within the next couple of years, but there's already been criticism and reporting that's come out that says that they're looking at numbers that are higher than a lot of studies, including federal studies, suggest may be safe. Um, and so it's really a question of what science you're using. And I think when People like Governor Sununu say we want to use the best possible science, and then people like Mindy Mesmer say we want to use the best possible science. They may be thinking of different science and different numbers there. I think we're going to see some debate over the numbers that come out, whatever they are, about if they're strict enough, if they are too expensive, and and how this these lawsuits will factor into that. And Annie, because of what you're saying, you know, the, the differences of opinion on the science and the diversity of the kind of chemicals that fall under this class, do those two things make it very hard to pin down liability on an issue like this? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think that is going to be one of the problems. I mean, already we're seeing... So in one of the lawsuits, in the firefighting foam lawsuit, they specifically say... Um, these chemicals are fungible. So that means like once it's all mixed in the ground together, you can't tell sort of who was responsible for which part of it, like which firefighting foam caused this bit of contamination versus this one. You can't tell. It's all mixed together. And so that's going to be a, a problem how they sort of sort out the liability there. And then also in some of the statements we've gotten from the companies being sued, they're already saying, well, we didn't make these chemicals in New Hampshire. And so there will be a, a process of sort of proving that they were used in state commerce, you know, that, that um, manufacturers or consumers in New Hampshire bought these products in a fairly direct way, used them in New Hampshire, and sort of proving the, um, the connection between these companies and the actual contamination we see in the state. That will be really hard. And that's why so far we've seen the state settle with companies like St. Gobain in Merrimack for using these chemicals, causing contamination in a sort of rampant and negligent manner where that's contaminated people's wells and St. Gobain has paid for water line upgrades in places like that. But, you know, really, you could argue that St. Gobain just bought these chemicals from someone else, used them sort of to their specifications, and it turned out the chemicals they had bought were harmful. And so who should really be on the hook for that? And this is sort of the t state taking the next step that a lot of advocates have long called for. Um, to to take it all the way back to the manufacturers and say, you know, you you sold us something that you knew was bad and and you need to make us whole for that. And so, yeah, the, I think it will be really interesting to see how the details get worked out because these lawsuits, when you read them, are, they, I mean, they're very detailed, but in a way that is very broad. I mean, they, they go into, they, they really break down the broad arguments in a very specific way, but they don't have specific locations or numbers or, um, you know, amounts of chemicals yet. And so that's going to be, the, the devil will be in the details as far as how much money we get and where the chemical companies can kind of push back on this. Well, Annie Ropeek, thank you very much for spelling out the details for us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And HPR's Annie Ropeek reports on energy and the environment, and you can find all of her reporting on PFAS in New Hampshire at our website, nhpr.org. This is the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup. I'm Peter Biella. One more story to talk about before the break, uh, and that's uh, Senate Bill 41, which passed mostly under the radar this week, but Dave Solomon of the Union Leader reported on it. Uh, basically, there is a push to allow a certain kind of video gambling on horse races that have already taken place. Uh, Kevin, uh, since it appeared in the Union Leader, I want to turn to you on this. So what are, what are these games like, betting on horse races that already happened? Well, this is one of the um, incremental expansions of legal, legalized gambling that's been pursued for a number of years in the legislature. If, in other words, if, if the New Hampshire House is um, deathly opposed to casino gambling as they are, what way can we generate more gambling money for the charitable programs that have these um, Monte Carlo nights and things such as that, mainly, by the way, at old racetracks. Those are some of the most popular venues. 
these historical racing machines is sort of like a slot machine. They show a race that has already occurred somewhere else, but you don't really know it's occurred and you don't know the results. So um, there is some skill involved, unlike a slot machine where you would just randomly pick a number of a horse. You can actually look at the statistics about all the horses that are in that race, uh, and that's one of the reasons supporters say it it's not just um, random gambling, uh, even like a kino. It's more like um, an ho- horse race betting that, sh- that would occur at a racetrack. And that is why it has a lot of support among people who historically have supported horse and dog racing. Where the charitable gaming folks are very concerned about the opening of the casino in Everett, Massachusetts. They think once that occurs right outside of Boston, that a lot of Folks who would go, come to these Monte Carlo nights aren't going to bother if they can drive less than an hour to a casino and get the full panoply of gambling. And that's one of the reasons why a number of places that host these charitable gaming games are really getting behind this legislation. Anna? Yeah, so just to provide some additional details, because when I first heard about it, it was it was a little odd to me. So it takes historic horse races and it takes out all of the, the names and other identifying information. And a player can see, you know, based on a randomly generated race, these are statistics and then it'll run it as it was run in the past. And the, the question is, how much is it like a slot machine or not? How And so supporters say it has a pace of play that's a lot slower than so, slot machines. Opponents say... That this this is a slot machine. It's a slot machine by another name. So it did come out of a House committee with a recommendation to pass. They'll vote on that next week. But also, we aren't talking about a huge amount of revenue here for the state. You know, if you look at the estimates in the bill, it was about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. So might you know this is this is really on the margins. I don't think it would be a massive change in terms of state policy on gambling. What's interesting is some people may not know that there are these charitable gaming locations around the state where uh, you can go and play t- play table games for a $10 max bet, and the organizations give, I think, 35% of their gross uh, receipts to, to charity. Uh, and so this is part of an expansion of that, that universe of uh, gaming and charitable giving. Right. So there are 14 locations around mm-hmm. the state, and you can do poker, roulette. Mm-hmm. There's also regulated bingo in New Hampshire. This is the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup on The Exchange, and uh, still to come, we'll talk about a few more stories in the week's news. Stay tuned. I'm Peter Biello. We'll be right back. Robert Mueller's investigation lasted 674 days. What happens next could rely on just 19 words. If we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. Also, new abortion laws push Disney to rethink where it does business, and wild weather impacts millions. The Friday News Roundup, next time on 1A. That's This Morning at 10 here on NHPR. Support for NHPR comes from your listeners and from Molten Farm and Garden Center in Meredith with fresh baked goods, produce, and grown at the farm annuals, perennials, vegetable plants, and hanging baskets. Moltenfarm.com. And from Northern New England Rare Book and Ephemera Fair in Concord, Rare Books and Ephemera on all subjects, June 2nd, book signing with Rebecca Rule. N-O-R-N-E-Bookfair.com. This is NHPR. This is the Weekly New Hampshire News Roundup on The Exchange on NHPR. I'm Peter Biello here in the studio with Anna Brown, Director of Research and Analysis at Citizens Count, Kevin Landrigan, Senior Reporter at the New Hampshire Union Leader, and Dean Spiliotis, Civic Scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU. The Gold Dome of the State House has been regilded, the brass has been polished, as the state readies for the bicentennial of the State House with celebrations taking place June 2nd through the 8th. Paul C. Smith, clerk of the New Hampshire House and on the State, Bice- state House Bicentennial Commission, uh, has been participating in the reenactment of an 1819 legislative session. He will be, rather, on Sunday afternoon, and Paul's on the line with me now. Hey, Paul, thanks for joining us. Uh, good a- good morning, Peter. Thank you for having me. So I want you to h- take us back 200 years or so. Uh, how were legislative sessions uh, different in 1819, besides the fashion, of course? Well, the fashion was, was, was definitely different, uh, but 
surprisingly, remarkably, um, some of the, the same uh, procedures and, and language that we use today, we used back then, um, terms that people often kind of get a little weirded out by, inexpedient to legislate and those sorts of things. Uh, those, those same terms are used to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that's just one of the uh, the, the many events that that's happening uh, this this upcoming week. On on Sunday, we will have our opening ceremony out front um, at one o'clock, and then at two, three, and four, uh, Speaker Shirtliff, Representative David Welch, and I will be doing eighteen, nineteen session reenactments, um, and there will also concurrently be uh, tours of the state house happening, and then uh, we've got a, a week long series of events planned uh, Monday, June 3rd. We have uh, the Governor's Roundtable, where most of our living governors will be there sharing some stories. And we'll, in, the, in the afternoon, we'll have an Executive Council Roundtable. Um, on Tuesday, we'll have the Supreme Court uh, in uh, Representatives Hall delivering oral arguments. And Wednesday, we're going to have a Cultural Heritage Day. Thursday is, is going to be one of my favorites, I think, the Legislative Homecoming Day, our Legislative Old Home Day. And uh, we're inviting all former members of the House and Senate to come on home to uh, to Concord and and uh, join us for a picnic and and uh, celebrate the the 200 years that our glorious building has uh, housed government. Well, Paul C. Smith, I want to unpack that a little bit. You've you've laid out quite an agenda of, of things yes. to come in the next few days. Um, let me ask you again about the the legislative sessions uh, 200 years ago. In the reenactment, sure. will you be discussing a piece of legislation that was up for debate 200 years ago? And if so, what is that piece of legislation? So actually, we won't. And the reason oh, for that is because, <laughs> because uh, the very first day, which was June 2nd, 1819, um, it was sort of the pro forma stuff. It was the swearing in of new members. It was the, uh, the there was an address by Governor Plummer. Um, there was a report on the the infrastructure of the state. Uh, so there was no legislation to come that day. Um, but the report uh, that was delivered by Governor Plummer has some very um, very meaningful statements, and he was a bit ahead of his time in terms of of some of the uh, the areas of civic uh, civic life that he outlined in that speech. And, and so we'll be reading a portion of that and, and uh, in dealing with some, some of the, of the other legislative minutia of the day, including electing the speaker and that sort of thing. And tell us a little bit more about the governor's round table uh, as uh, the governor's day is uh, of part of the celebrations. Who's, who's going to be attending? Is, are all the, the living former New Hampshire governors going to attend? So, so the only one that I know is not going to be there for sure is governor Greg, because he's out of the country. Uh, but I believe that everybody else will be there that morning. So uh, that'll be a that'll be a pretty neat event to have uh, seven of the eight living governors there. Um, both Senator Shaheen and Hassan will be there. Um, they'll be they'll be leaving right from there to get back to Washington. But uh, we we definitely are very happy that they're going to join us and, and and share some memories and stories as well. Uh, Adam Sexton from WMUR will be moderating the roundtable and uh, and asking some questions and, and, and getting some feedback from, from our living governors. Questions and, and like, what are they going to be talking about? What it was like to be governor? Or how Maybe compare notes on how it's changed over the years? Uh, perhaps. Maybe share some some stories, some fond memories of the building itself. Because, you know, the, although the building is turning 200 years old, it, there's so much that's happened in that building in 200 years that that really um, has shaped the, the the course of our state's life, and and I think that that might be something that they all focus on a little bit. Um, but it's I did I did want to just mention Peter too that that every event that's happening this week is open to the public, and we want um, members of the public to come and see and participate. Um, even on on Sunday when we do our session reenactments, um, we'll be allowing the public to uh, to vote uh, along with our. With, with our speaker and, and uh, Representative Welch uh, for, for the day. So, you know, people can, can get their best eyes and knees uh, ready to go. Uh, did you mention something as well about the Executive Council? Yes, at 1 o'clock on Monday, the Executive Councilors will be having a roundtable as well uh, in the Governor and Council Chamber um, and uh, sharing some of the same sorts of their stories and, and uh, reflections and that sort of thing. And we've got uh, I believe at least 14 have confirmed right now. So, and and a few more may show up. So it's it's going to be a it's going to be a pretty amazing event that that uh, is bringing all of these folks together for for this great 
great event, and and you know that the the whole uh, notion of, of of partisanship has no place this week because we're really above that. You know, we're 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 focusing on uh, the building and, and the civic life of of our citizenry and and what has really compelled uh, people to be a part of of our government for the last couple hundred years. And and so. Uh... Share a little history knowledge with us. Uh, the Executive Council back in the, in the 19th century, how might it have been different from the way it is now? Well, that's, that's a good question. I, I will tell you that Governor Plummer, um, when he, there, were, there were a couple of points during his administration where uh, if he nominated somebody to office and um, he did not have a majority of the Executive Council uh, to confirm the, uh, their votes, uh, then he would have looked to the council to make a nomination, and and that is certainly uh, not the practice of today. Um, but uh, you know that that certainly uh, did give them a bit more of a of a power structure um, than than certainly what they have today. But I mean, you know, obviously the, the executive council, just like our our governor and and, and legislature, um, they're the, all of those powers and and, and uh, the history over the last couple hundred years has brought us to where we are. And, you know, part of it's it's been a learning experience. I mean, no other place in the country has an executive council, and and um, it's to, to evolve to where it is today. It's it's obviously gone through its own uh, pains and and, and uh, tribulations, but it's, uh, it's yeah. There was a point today. right where it was almost eliminated. The executive council. I bel- that is correct. Back and in- there have been there have been attempts to do that throughout history. Um, you know, uh, but um, I don't know. It's just. It's the same reason why the, we we always talk about decreasing the size of the legislature, and it's never happened because <laughs> there's just such a such an appeal um, that you know anybody can do this, anybody can can run for representative, anybody can can do this, and 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 truly be an active participant in, in New Hampshire government. And, and and I know that sounds a little bit idealistic, but. Um, that's certainly what I believe. Hey, Paul, this is Kevin Landrigan. One of the things I think most people in New Hampshire don't know is how 200 years ago that state house basically functioned as the only entity in all of government. Could you talk a little bit about what actually was housed in that building when it first opened and and the legislature and so many other operations of government lived under its same roof? Oh, absolutely, Kevin, and uh, nice to talk to you, by the way. Um, the the building itself, uh, uh, if you actually look on our website, uh, and I would encourage everybody to go to the website so they can see the list of events and everything else, nhstatehouse200.com, um, but uh, you can see some old, um, uh, there's a woodcut of, of how it looked. There's actually a photo from about 1850 of what the original 1819 structure looked like, um, and it wasn't that big. Uh, the building itself, it was it was still a pretty grand building, but it wasn't uh, nearly the structure it is today. But it did. It housed the adjutant general's office. It ha- it housed the secretary of state, the state treasurer, the governor. Um, every branch of government was housed there. The uh, the library was housed there. Um, everything. Uh, the legislature. Um, the the governor's office was actually directly off of the back of representatives' hall. Um, and the, the 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 House chamber itself, which, by the way, both the House and the Senate still meet in their original chambers. The the, the layout has changed slightly, and 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 um, and that sort of thing. But but the but the building itself is, is just sort of increased its footprint. But um, obviously, as government has expanded over the last two hundred years, you, you know, we're obviously all spread out across Concord now uh, for all of the agencies, but. But to think of uh, to think of everything having been in that one building 200 years ago is pretty amazing. Well, Paul C. Smith, clerk of the New Hampshire House, who serves on the State House Bicentennial Commission, thanks very much for giving us a preview of what's to come. Thank you very much, Peter. This is the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup on the Exchange on NHPR. I'm Peter Biello. Also in the news this week, uh, Democrats. Uh, are pushing ahead to undo election law changes that they argue will lead to voter suppression. Uh, The Senate voted yesterday 14 to 10 along party lines to pass a bill that essentially repeals a 2017 law requiring additional documentation from voters who register within 30 days of an election. Uh, Governor Sununu uh, opposes this repeal, and those who uh, also oppose it say that that, um, fears about SB3 uh, suppressing the vote have been overblown. Here's Republican Senator Senator Regina Birdsell. 
Senate Bill 3 was used for almost a year and a half in um, municipal, state, federal elections with no, neg no negative impacts, and no one was denied the right to vote under Senate Bill 3. So Regina Birdsell saying no one was denied the right to vote. It's not a voter suppression thing. We need to sort of look at this with a level head. Dean, what are mm -hmm. your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this is part of a larger debate that's been going on in the state for a number of years now over, uh, you know, voter registration, voter ID, uh, trying to determine who rightfully gets to vote in the state. And this SB3, uh, which which uh, gives voters 30 days to uh, to prove that they live in the state with some documentation uh, if they're new voters uh, or face, I think it was a $5,000 fine. Uh, very early on, the court put a stay on that fine. The argument was that, that a large fine like that essentially works as a disincentive uh, to vote and essentially a, a form of a poll tax. And so that's been one of the legal arguments. Uh, this SB3, HB 1264, which essentially uh, uh, replaces the, the previous language with residency requirements, uh, these are continue to be debated. The Democrats are trying to roll them back. Uh, I, I, Governor Sununu is obviously not going to sign on to any kind of a rollback, and these things are going to make their way through the through the courts. But it's a part of a larger debate we've had in the state, really going back to Bill O'Brien in 2011 and voter ID, uh, that mirrors a larger debate around the around the country about uh, who should be able to vote legally in a particular state, what penalties should they be subject to, do the penalties constitute some sort of a poll tax, those kinds of questions. Anna Brown. So, yes, yesterday the How the Senate passed HB 105, which undoes SB 3. Next week they're going to vote on HB 106 to do undo HB 1264. There's there's so many bills going in around this. And as Dean said, you know, Sununu is probably not going to put any of these through. But it is interesting to note there's another bill that's kind of been flying under the radar, SB 67. And so it would leave those voting laws as they were changed under Republicans, but it would exempt temporary residents from motor vehicle laws. So that means that if you're a college student or in the military or, or maybe you're uh, on temporarily here as a nurse, that you wouldn't have to register your car and get a driver's license to claim you're a resident, which is required now. If that, that if you're voting, that means you're a resident. That means now you have to follow the motor vehicle laws. So this would just have a carve out and say, well, no, you don't have to follow those motor vehicle laws. And that's something that the Secretary of State came in and said, you know, let's leave these laws as is. Having these different definitions for different residents is kind of crazy, but you could you could do a carve out. Other states have a carve out where college students, for example, don't have to register their cars. And so I think it's possible that that one will get by and then that we'll, we'll see a little bit of relief for college students and temporary residents related to that law. But yeah, the, the, other, the other laws, as Dean said, I think are just going to stay as they are for now and work through the courts. And one last thing to discuss uh, this hour is that the, the New Hampshire Senate has put uh, a minimum wage bill on hold, but another version remains alive in the House. The state uses the federal minimum of $7.25 an hour, which is the lowest in New England. Uh, both the House and Senate have passed a slightly different bills that would establish a state minimum wage, gradually increase it to 12 bucks an hour over several years. Uh, we have been profiling people on All Things Considered this week who would be affected by a raise uh, in the state's minimum wage. Uh, Richard French, owner of the Works Cafe, has locations in New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, says he would like to see minimum wage rise in New Hampshire for the sake of his workers. Well, if it's a forced mandate, then everybody's going to go up, right? So all of our competitors will go out. And so it's going, it will, I believe, force the water to rise. But Keenan Carrigan had a different view of the minimum wage going up to 12 bucks an hour. She co-directs a daycare center in Gorham, and she says raising the minimum wage to $12 an hour would be a disaster for her. It would be detrimental for our business because we can't ask our families to pay anymore. Like, they're strapped right now. And there are comprehensive comments. You can find them at NHPR.org. But uh, to our panelists, maybe start with you, Dean. Uh, yeah. Your thoughts on, on the uh, the outlook for the <laughs> remaining minimum wage bill this session? Yeah, there's. I, I don't see any way in which Governor Sununu would, would sign this piece of legislation. Uh, if, if there ever was a litmus test between Republicans and Democrats other than perhaps uh, the abortion issue, it's minimum wage. Republicans just do not support increasing the minimum wage. Uh, I recall uh, we had uh, Governor Sununu on the exchange right after he was uh, reelected and, and basically said there's no way he would support a rise in the minimum wage. Anna Brown. Another argument that I've been hearing recently from some businesses is the idea that New Hampshire has such a low unemployment rate that there is already upward pressure on the wage without raising the minimum wage illegally and that it's sort of going to take care of itself. And of course, once again, Democrats say, no, this is a priority. We're, we're the lowest in New England. We need to raise it. But I, I think realistically, the wages are going up. Well, I think with a, with a 
tight labor market as well. I think supporters of the minimum wage argue if you raise the minimum, you raise wages as a result, and you, you more likely get people to come to jobs in New Hampshire. That have been wanting for the last couple of years now. Employers have been basically saying, we can't fill the jobs we have. Well, these stories certainly have generated a lot of discussion on social media, and uh, we hope that you will continue to discuss all the stories we discussed today on the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup. I want to thank our panel of esteemed reporters and analysts, Anna Brown, Director of Research and Analysis at Citizens Count, Kevin Landrigan, Senior Reporter at the New Hampshire Union Leader, and Dean Spiliota, Civic Scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU. Thanks very much for being here. Happy Friday. Thanks, Peter. Happy Friday, indeed. That's it for today. Remember, keep the conversation up on Facebook and at NHPR.org. The Exchange is a production of New Hampshire Public Radio. The engineer is Dan Colgan. Our senior producer is Ellen Grimm. Michael Brinley is our program manager. Our producers are Jessica Hunt and Christina Phillips. Our public radio fellow is Ali Oshinsky. Dan Tui is working the cameras today. Our theme music was composed by Bob Lord. I'm Peter Biello. Thank you very much for listening, and have a great weekend. I thought it was a moment of history, a moment when hope and history rhyme, so to speak. And I couldn't help but reflect over the past two decades, all the times I'd sat there and watched votes cast, and the times I'd cast votes on it, and this is one time when the outcome was what I had hoped.